Nephritic syndrome is a collection of signs and symptoms that result from glomerulonephritis, which is inflammation of the kidney, specifically the glomerulus. This can be remembered because itis means inflammation. Rather than being a disease itself, nephritic syndrome is the manifestation of an underlying disease that causes the inflammation, and there are many of these causes. It is easily confused with nephrotic syndrome, which instead is a collection of signs and symptoms resulting from a high amount of protein being lost through the kidneys in the urine. This leads to hypoalbuminemia, meaning low levels of albumin in the blood. These are the two defining features in nephrotic syndrome. There is some overlap, but nephritic syndrome is different in that the degree of proteinuria is lower and there is the presence of hematuria, meaning blood in the urine, which could be microscopic or macroscopic. Red blood cell casts in the urine, sterile pyuria, which is the presence of white blood cells without evidence of bacteria, hypertension and oligouria, which is a reduced urine output, typically between 80 and 400 milliliters per day. The functional unit of the kidney is the nephron, which includes the glomerulus, a modified capillary. Surrounding this, there are multiple layers which together form a filter. These include a fenestrated endothelium, the glomerular basement membrane, and the foot processes of podocytes, which are cells that wrap around the capillary. In most cases of nephritic syndrome, there is a trigger causing inflammation in this area. Overall, featuring cellular proliferation, complement activation, recruitment of leukocytes, and production of proteases and free radicals that ultimately lead to injury of the kidney. This then leads to the characteristic features. For example, injury to the glomerular filtration membrane allows protein to leak into the urine, though not as much as is seen in nephrotic syndrome. Red blood cells can also pass through, causing hematuria, and they can be dysmorphic, with acanthocytes in particular suggesting glomerular injury. Red blood cells can also clump together within the tubules, forming cylindrical structures called casts. In fact, this is considered suggestive of glomerulonephritis. The injury and inflammation means white blood cells are recruited and can pass into the urine. And as we said, it's termed sterile pyuria because there is no bacteria present. As the glomerular filtration rate falls, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system can be activated, leading to sodium retention and hypertension. The reduced urine output is also the result of a reduced glomerular filtration rate. Overall, the reduced protein level can lead to fluid overload, which could manifest with periorbital or peripheral edema, raised jugular venous pressure, and even pulmonary edema, which itself could present with dyspnea. Symptoms may also be the result of the underlying cause, for example, a fever in infectious causes, hemoptysis in anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, or a rash and joint pain in systemic immune causes. Like we said, nephritic syndrome is a result of glomerular inflammation, but what can make this a difficult topic is that there are many ways this inflammation can be caused. To make it easier to remember, we can divide them into subtypes. First, we will cover rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, also known as crescentic glomerulonephritis, which isn't a cause in itself, but is a possible pattern caused by many underlying disorders. It can be divided into anti-glomerular basement membrane, immune complex mediated, and porcy immune. It's important to understand that although any of these causes can present as rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, they don't always cause it. This layout just makes it a little bit easier to remember. Generally, it features a poor prognosis, as it gets its name from the rapid progression from previously functioning kidneys to end-stage renal failure in a matter of weeks. 
it features a crescentic proliferation of epithelial cells, mostly from the parietal side of the Bowman's capsule on histology, with additional features based on what's causing it. Often, over 50% of the glomeruli are affected. In antiglomerular basement membrane disease, also known as good pastures disease, there are antibodies produced that target the glomerular basement membrane, specifically the NC1 domain of the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen. These antibodies will also target the alveoli, as the same collagen is expressed there. Therefore, patients can also present with alveolar damage manifesting as hemoptysis. In most cases, anti-GBM goes on to cause rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. For the diagnosis, the antibodies themselves can be found in the blood, and on immunofluorescence, there are linear deposits of these antibodies along the glomerular basement membrane. Within immune complex mediated, we have IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger disease, which features excessive production of galactose-deficient IgA molecules, which are then targeted by other IgA and IgG, leading to immune complex formation that are then deposited in the mesangium of the kidney. It happens characteristically during or one to two days following an upper respiratory tract infection, but may also present following a gastrointestinal infection. The systemic form of this disease is IgA vasculitis, also known as henoch schoenlein purpura, where the deposits are throughout the body rather than only in the kidney, which can present as a rash, abdominal pain and arthritis. In IgA nephropathy, there can be high titers of IgA in the blood with normal complement levels, whereas in the other two immune-mediated causes we'll discuss, complement levels are usually low. On immunofluorescence, there is a deposition of IgA immune complexes, typically in the mesangium. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is another cause often confused with IgA nephropathy due to also being post-infectious, but in this case, it is two to three weeks following an infection, typically from group A streptococcal bacteria such as pharyngitis or soft tissue infections. IgG and IgM antibodies form immune complexes with bacterial antigens, most commonly M-type virulence factors, which then get deposited in the glomerular basement membrane sub-epithelially, meaning between the GBM and the podocytes. These antigens can also first get trapped in the GBM and then be targeted by antibodies. It mostly affects children between the ages of 3 and 12, but can also affect elderly patients. However, cases in adults feature a worse prognosis. In most cases, due to pharyngitis, there are positive anti-streptolysin O titers, which is an exotoxin produced by streptococcal bacteria. There are granular sub-epithelial immune complex deposits on immunofluorescence, described as lumpy bumpy on electron microscopy. Then we have diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, which can actually cause both nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. It is the most common manifestation of lupus nephritis. The exact mechanism is not entirely understood, but is thought to be linked to deposition of anti-double-stranded DNA complexes. It typically has over 50% of the glomeruli affected. Blood tests can show positivity for autoantibodies, such as double-stranded DNA and anti-nuclear antibodies, and on light microscopy, there can be thickening of the capillary wall, giving a wire loop appearance. On immunofluorescence and electron microscopy, there are sub-endothelial granular deposits. Then we have the Porsi immune class. These are causes where there are no anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies and no immune deposits formed. For example, anchor vasculitis due to anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, where these antibodies are produced against neutrophil components, specifically 
P anchor against myeloperoxidase and C anchor against proteinase 3. Ultimately, this leads to activation and recruitment of more immune cells in the kidney, which over time leads to fibrosis. Examples are granulomatosis with polyangitis, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, and microscopic polyangitis. 90% of porcy immune cases are anchor positive, but there are some cases where they are negative. There are no immune complexes seen on microscopy, but there is general positivity of P or C anchor on the bloods, with C anchor being more associated with granulomatosis with polyangitis. Allport syndrome is a genetic condition that features defects in type 4 collagen, which is usually inherited in an X-linked fashion, but can be autosomal recessive or dominant in some cases. It typically affects the kidneys, the inner ear and the eyes, which can manifest as a triad of hematuria, progressive sensory neural hearing loss and cataracts. It features lamellation of the glomerular basement membrane on electron microscopy, meaning the presence of abnormal additional layers, giving a thicker appearance. Next is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. It's another pattern that can be seen in both nephritic and nephrotic syndrome, and has two main types. Type 1 is linked to hepatitis B and C, as well as cryoglobulinemia, while type 2 is also known as dense deposit disease, featuring deposits of C3 complement within the glomerular basement membrane. In type 1, there are granular subendothelial deposits on immunofluorescence, and there can be a tram track appearance of the GBM due to it being split by mesangial proliferation. In type 2, the intramembranous deposits of C3 in the GBM cause it to split, giving the tram track appearance. Overall, the presence of nephritic syndrome can be suspected from the physical exam and history, for example, a recent infection followed by fluid overload and hypertension, then confirmed with lab investigations like urinalysis demonstrating red blood cell casts or dysmorphic red blood cells, this would also include detection of pyuria and quantification of proteinuria, largely done now through the protein to creatinine ratio. Serum creatinine, urea, and electrolytes would also be taken to evaluate kidney function. Then, if required, more specific tests would be done, like looking for the antibodies or a kidney biopsy to get the histological patterns that we've described. The treatment involves supportive care as well as treatment of the underlying cause. Steroids are used in most cases as there is usually an immune component causing the nephritic syndrome. And in severe cases, other immunosuppressants like cyclosporine, tacrolimus, or even rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are given as they can help reduce hypertension by interrupting the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and also help to reduce proteinuria. Antibiotics are given to treat any suspected infections, for example penicillin in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and diuretics are used to treat fluid overload, mostly loop diuretics like furosemide. In some cases, like anti-GBM disease, plasmapheresis, where blood is filtered extracorporeally to remove the causative antibodies. Patients may also require renal replacement therapy. The mnemonic AEIOU can help you remember indications, like severe acidosis or electrolyte imbalances, intoxication with drugs or medication, fluid overload, or symptomatic uremia. This could be done through dialysis, but renal transplant may be the only treatment in some cases.